everyone, my name is Kat Savage and I'm a clinical hypnotherapist and well-being expert working in the creative arts sector. In my line of work, I get to meet some amazing, colourful people, from actors to artists, people who live their lives by their own rules, fueled by passion and determination to bring their unique talents into the world. I wanted to discover what it took for people to leave the usual nine to five and hop on a dream, to capture their bravest moments and share these meaningful conversations with you, so that together we can explore the ideas, emotions and moments that could potentially change our lives too. The Brave Moment podcast starts now, in the middle of the COVID pandemic, probably the bravest moment not only for my guests, but for the whole world. So let's keep talking, have some fun and enjoy the show. My guest today is actress and filmmaker Katie Goldfinch. Katie exploded into my life a few years ago and I could just tell that she was someone very special. Not only an incredible talent, but also a great heart. She has featured in the recent film Lucid, currently streaming across all major platforms from Prime to Virgin, and in the feature film Crucible of the Vampire, currently on cinematic release in Germany. You can also catch her on many a series, including the prestigious ITV drama Endeavour. She has recently come back from Cuba where she has been making a documentary and has many new projects in the pipeline. Today we talk about turning childhood dreams into reality, wacky auditions, how to stand up for what you believe in, what it's like to be a woman in the creative arts today and take advice on looking after your mental health in one of the most challenging creative arts. Activist, minimalist, neuroscientist and of course actress, I introduce you to the incredible Katie Goldfinch. the show. Hello, thank you for having me. You are so welcome and thank you for having us. We've just uh, seen a little bit into your life on a boat, which is pretty (laughs) amazing. I mean, crikey, you're a glamorous girl living on a very cute houseboat. How are you finding (laughs) that, my friend? Um, It's it's a really wonderful experience. It's something that I decided to do so that I could be, I could monitor my climate impact, my um, carbon footprint. And also so I could create more space in my life to be more creative. That's amazing. We were talking just a bit before the show a little bit about minimalism. And as I've walked in here, uh, I mean, for the listeners, there is literally just the basic means of survival, isn't there? Uh, Apart from this delicious bookcase, which is filled with absolutely amazing books, which I want to (laughs) borrow. Sidetracked much. Um, So talking about minimalism and creating more space for creativity... How how do you declutter your life to to make that happen? Like, how did that impact your life when you moved on here? How did it change your thought processes? So I realised I needed enough space in my schedule to have room for spontaneity. And when I realised that every part of my day, of every week, of every month was planned, I wasn't able to spontaneously decide to do something, to create something. And I realised that that was due to the outgoings that I had to maintain and keep up with and that I needed to change my lifestyle. And so that's when I decided to move onto a boat so that I could reduce my outgoings. I could keep an eye on what I was using all the time, mainly electricity. And so, yeah, being on the water in a calmer atmosphere means that I do find myself being more creative and I have more time in my day to do that. That's amazing. Oh, I'm kind of jealous in a weird way. (laughs) (laughs) So let's get on to the subject at hand. You are, of course, an actress. And I want to take you all the way back to your childhood because in my mind, I just imagine you prancing around on stages everywhere and doing all of that kind of stuff. But what was it really like growing up with that ambition in your head? That is what it was like. (laughs) (laughs) Amazing. (laughs) From the tender age of what I think might have been about six, I can remember just knowing that I had to do it and and kind of really relating to all of the performances that I saw, whether that was live or on television, and just knowing that I needed to learn it. I had to do it. And that there was just this, 
yeah, knowing that it was part of who I was, um, a calling, as it has been described by many people. <laughs> um, so, yeah, any opportunity to perform, dress up. Um, I'd push all the furniture to one side in the living room and create dances. I'd demand everyone watch this performance that I'd made up. I'd demand from my teachers at primary school that I perform in the assembly weekly. I'd make sets so that me and my friends could perform in the playground. Like, oh, was it? <laughs> I must have been a nightmare to be around, but I had a good time. How did your parents respond to that energy? Because, I mean, I speak to so many creative people and there seems to be only sort of two different paths that they take as a child. Either they're pushed into it or they are allowed to express themselves and they're encouraged into it. Which one are you? Um, definitely the latter, fortunately. Um, I've, I've definitely been encouraged very much by my mum to do what I want and to explore who I am. And um, I've definitely been told a few times to think before I speak, uh, <laughs> which I'm still trying to remind myself of daily. Um, my dad was... Uh, he took a little longer to come around to the idea of what I wanted to do. Um, but mainly just because he wanted to give me the right setup in life. Um, and, you know, when you are a youngster, even if you're persistent in what you know you want for yourself, you're young, you know. And so my dad wanted to make sure that I had what I needed in order to go out and generate a good life for myself. And so it wasn't until maybe I was about 17 that he kind of really jumped on board with it. He saw me in a show. I played Galinda in Wicked. And oh, my he, God. As, a, a, an amateur production, by the way. It wasn't West End yet. And when he saw that, that's when he was, like, fully behind me after that. I think there's an element in all creative fields where you always have to prove yourself, whether it's to someone who knows that you're good already, um, they still want to see the proof in the pudding, basically. And even when you meet new people and you say what you do, they go, oh, go on then, give us a monologue or give us a scene, <laughs> which is hilarious because if someone told me they were a lawyer, I wouldn't say, oh, give us a little segment of your day. I wouldn't say, how, how would you write up this contract then? What clause here? What does that mean? I wouldn't test you on your living just because you've stated it to me. It's one of the funniest things um, and I always kind of then go, well what do you do? Oh okay and kind of interact in that way which is really nice and I'm obviously very proud of what I do and I'm always happy to perform mm. but the kind of challenge of the needing to prove oneself is kind of relentless and a bit exasperating sometimes. How do you deal with that emotionally? Um, it's difficult because you your ability to kind of put yourself aside to be a character is one of the biggest skills in being an actor. And sometimes that's really difficult to do if you've had a really difficult time mm. or a... a big argument on the way to a big audition or if in fact the character that you're that the character that you're playing is so similar to yourself or something that you've been through it's very difficult to realize what is you that is um the obstacle if that makes sense yeah, no, it totally does. so um that's been really important for me and certainly in my last few years have i realized um how important it is to do the self-work on myself through meditation, through self-awareness, self-inquiry, have I only been able to detect what is interfering with my practice as an actor and what is me helping, my experience helping being yeah. the character, if that makes sense. So in, in regard to kind of proving yourself and when you're meeting people and getting challenged, sometimes it's easy, sometimes it's hard. But I'm getting better in, in dealing with it in terms of being honest in how I feel mm. as myself because I'm so used to putting on a persona. It's It's been difficult in my earlier years to kind of realise what's a persona and what's me, etc. Mm. So I'm getting better at going, you know what, I'd rather not talk about it today, you know. That's a really big stand to make, I think, because so many times people, especially in your particular career, 
having to put those guards up all the time or just completely breaking down because you're so interactive with what you're doing. You're working on literally every single emotional level that could possibly exist and you're having to be that person and that person and you're in a relationship and you're living on a houseboat and you're like, you know, you're, you're so many different spectrums of colour in your life that it must be quite difficult to fathom exactly that kind of energy is with people that are pushing you constantly to be something else or to expect a certain characteristic to be present um coming back to your training so i i know that you started off in dance didn't you and then you went into acting as a secondary like art form um when when did it kick in that you were like no acting's the way forward as opposed to as, as opposed to any other performing arts so i trained in every aspect of um the performing arts arc let's say mm. um so i i began in dancing and then i started acting and dancing as a byproduct of going to drama school so i always was um learning how to do all three disciplines but um it wasn't until i was maybe 20 that i realized i needed to stop dancing because i had favored dancing in the beginning but also because um because I'd been given the opportunities in the dancing industry, mm. I was working all the time as a dancer, which was wonderful. And I had a great time and I'm so glad that I did it. But it distracted me from actually what I really wanted to do. And it wasn't really until I was like 19, 20 that I went, hang on, I, I've just been doing this thing because I'm good at it, I enjoy it, I'm being offered opportunities, but it's actually not what I want to do. Because I always wanted to play leads in musical theatre, leads in television shows. And I was sort of driven by an element of fame when I was younger. That's not the case anymore, I'm fortunate <laughs> to say. Um, a decade later, my motivation has definitely changed. But back then, I was motivated by kind of glory and um, being well known in my industry. And so... Fortunately, at the age of 20, still young enough to make a transition, I started turning down dance jobs and I made a commitment to really put all my energy into acting. And so that's when I decided to go to L.A. and I went there for a while. Oh, what was that like in, in terms of the people? Because, I mean, obviously, when you go to certain cities and stuff, you have a vibe of the people and there is a stigma attached to certain people. And obviously, I have a perceived, like idea of what it might be like to be there but what is it really like in LA? It's probably exactly how you think it's <laughs> it's wrinkly necks and Botox faces, <laughs> couple of little dogs and a green smoothie and <laughs> and it's the oh so where are you from uh, loads of talk about your accent loads of talk about what jobs they've got coming up um I loved it in the first two and a half weeks. I had a great time and I, I had quite a lot of instant success because I did a lot of groundwork before I went out there. In what sense? In that I, I think within three days I had an agent, a manager and a sponsor for a visa and I was going in for pilot season auditions. So I was like really quickly moving and, and it made me go, oh my goodness, this is what's possible here. Bugger London, bugger England, <laughs> this is me, I'm staying here. And I was there um, in the transition from turning, going from 20 to age 21. Yeah. And also the Oscars were on, so I went to loads of parties and I met loads of great people and it was wonderful. But I realised after two and a half weeks, it was a very short space of time, that how kind of transient it was and how superficial it was and how... Um, very quickly people would realise if you couldn't help them, they would drop you. And I met some wonderful people out there who were friends of friends who I got to know and I asked them when I was seriously considering staying if they genuinely had any people that they trusted, any friends, real friends. And they all said no. And they looked me in the eye and they said, I'm sorry to tell you this, but no. Um, and I had a few experiences with... Um, with auditions where you'd go into a room full of loads of people waiting to be seen for the same part who look exactly the same as you. And in, in England, people would talk to you in the audition room sometimes, but at least it was a friendly atmosphere. Mm. It was totally different in the States. I mean, LA specifically, um, I haven't uh, 
gone and worked in New York. So um, people would just look at you up and down and then kind of look away. And it was just quite brutal. And, and the training there was amazing because it's mm. much more free-flowing. It's much more exaggerated, but kind of indulgent. Mm. Um, and also there's a lot more bullshit there's so many yes people but then it takes longer to figure out what's real and what isn't and it takes longer to filter through that process and career is important yes but I feel like career will be successful if I'm happy in my day to day and mm. I just couldn't see that happening there so I chose to leave not long after I arrived really were you a bit gutted about that? Were you gutted that it was that way or were you just relieved and like you knew then exactly what you didn't want from the experience? Yeah, definitely the latter. I was relieved because I thought I never wanted to move away from my home country and leave my family and friends behind. Mm. But I thought that that's what I had to do. And actually, I did have to do that experience because it taught me so much about how far I'm willing to go. Um, but... Uh, equally, it made me kind of sad that that's where people go, you mm. know, in order to to be successful, that that's what they believe they have to do is not have a support network around them and, and kind of step over other people if that means getting ahead. And that was kind of a, an eye-opener for me as a young 20-year-old to kind of go, wow, this is real. It's quite a level-headed response at such a young age to this particularly <laughs> brutal industry. Um, just talking a little bit more about the the sort of more realistic aspects of the industry or the darker side of the industry, if you like. Um, I know that you've mentioned previously when we've been chatting over email about the, the Me Too movement and how you've had an experience of that yourself being in the industry that you're in. Can you elaborate a little bit on that, on your experience, if you're you know, willing to. Absolutely. I think it's a, a wonderful thing that we're now able to op openly speak about this um, with men and women. Um, I have been challenged many times in my career. I mean, it's taken me 10 years to establish myself in this industry, a long time. And it's definitely had its um, ups and downs because of various men involved in mm. that journey. And it's definitely just been the men more than... The women because I know that women can be brutal in a different way can't they? I, I've not experienced that with women mm -hmm. um fortunately but actually largely my experience working relationships has been with men in yeah. the industry all the decision makers are men um and very little experience have I had with women more so in my last few years which mm. has been wonderful and I have got male friends who have spoken about the kind of me too aspect of of the in opposition and that they've had women kind of manipulate them mm. um fortunately i have i've never been physically attacked but i have been emotionally manipulated and i have been propositioned countless times wow. and it was really interesting because i was at um london film festival when the weinstein story broke out and i i literally re-met all of the men at that festival. All, all of the men's not very fair to say, but I would say maybe 80% of the men that I'd already met a few days prior to the news outbreak, um, when I saw them again, they were a totally different person with me. And that was when I realised collectively the palpable impact of how I'm seen and therefore how I'm treated because I'm an actor, you know? And that was a really difficult realisation because... Personally, I've experienced lots of things like one-on-one -on -one with people, you know, like emotional manipulation or messages and things like that. And, and in some cases, just before an audition, the director's, like, messaged me, propositioning me. And so you go into this room going, why am I here? Like, yeah. you're not... You you haven't called me in because you, you're interested in what I'm going to generate creatively. The worst instance I've been in was in LA and I got locked in a car and they wouldn't let me out. But... They never physically handled me, but they were shouting at me in this car, and basically... How did you respond to that? Well... Especially at such a young age, to keep your wits about you. How? How do you deal with that? I just... I spoke really calmly. I don't know, it's weird. I just kind of knew I needed to opposite his energy, mm. and I needed to say, if you don't let me out of this car, I'm going to scream as loud as I possibly can and I don't care what it takes I will make sure that you don't I can't even remember what I said but yeah. I basically said like whatever it takes like you're not getting away with this 
And after much reasoning, what felt like must have been about half an hour, it was probably about seven minutes, um, realistically, he eventually just let me out. But when he let me out, I was in the middle of nowhere, in the dark, and he drove off, and I had no idea where I was because I wasn't from that area, you know? I was in the middle of, I think, Studio City in LA. And I called my friend, who was a friend of a friend, and I said, I just called him in a state of hysterics saying, hey, I'm in the middle of nowhere. Like, this is before, like, you could drop a pin and be like, track your location. <laughs> and, and like, I was in the States as well. So I didn't have, a, like, a phone, you know, that I could, um, that I could do, like, um, Google Map or anything. So um, this wonderful friend of a friend, um, kept, like, managed to track me down, managed to find me and then took me to a, five guys I think got a burger and <laughs> got over it but it's really hard in that it's all of these um situations have affected me for sure mm. but I've I've definitely developed a deep strength from that as well but I've definitely since developed issues with working with men and I'm I'm still working on that I just hate the fact that you've been through it like on a personal level and yeah. now you have to be conscious of that in your work. Do you reckon that's one of the reasons that maybe you've turned your hand to being in production yourself, mm. being a woman behind the camera as well as on it? Does that give you a different perspective of the work that you are having to challenge in the masculine world, that is? Yeah, totally. There was definitely an element of I'm going to take the power back here and I'm going to start generating content and I'm going to start making um, opportunities for people that are um, that deserve an opportunity, you know, whether that be a man or whether that be a transgender person or whatever. Um, and so I... Uh, I started my first sort of production role really was when I created a show for me and my out of work actor friends to put on so that we can invite casting directors and agents. And when I organised that and many of my uh, the people that were involved said, oh, you should really like look at organising in, in the film industry or whatever, um, kind of made me realise that I did have a good kind of skill for it. Let's say just being bossy um, <laughs> and organised. Um, so... I then just started making some short films here and there to see how that would go. And then I was asked by a couple of people to assist on their projects and then got recommended from that to do up bigger projects, um, which is really wonderful. And so I've had quite a, a, a range of experiences in producing um, in, in different involvement levels. Um, and then about four years ago, I was given an opportunity to make a documentary in Cuba which um, is now nearly finished. Congratulations. <laughs> Four years later. <laughs> Way! <laughs> um, but when that opportunity entered my life, I wasn't intending to make documentaries. It just kind of happened because somebody thought that I would know how to make it happen. And being the opportunist that I am, I went, yeah, I can. Of course yeah. I can. <laughs> For a country. Like don't yes, know. Woman. Yeah. <laughs> That's exactly what happened. So, um, but throughout that process, which has been a real roller coaster, I've realised, wow, this is a, this is something that I'm really passionate about is um, vehicling stories that need to be told, and whether that's being behind the camera, whether that's organising the people that bring it to light, or whether that's being the character that channels that story. You know, that's kind of what I realised in these last few years is that that's what I am. I'm just a vehicle for great stories. That is absolutely stunning. OK, talking about your acting, coming back to you being on screen, can you remember your first audition? Sure. I mean, my first audition, I it was for... Um, oh, oh, what's it called? It's that... Um, where they sing, I'm going to wash that man right out of my head. I'm going to wash... Oh, South Pacific. South Pacific. <laughs> <laughs> but it was for an amateur production in Hayward Heath, where I used to live. Or it might have been Burgess Hill. And I had to sing, I'm going to wash that man right out of my hair, on the stage while someone was washing my hair with a bucket. <laughs> <laughs> and that was your first audition that's my first audition oh my goodness um, <laughs> did you think did you question yourself then why am I doing this I was so young <laughs> I think the teachers were just like let's see what else they'll do I, that's the only that's gotta be the only reason why that happened 
but um, I've got a weird relationship with auditions. It is, it's an interesting thing because you've got to be so emotionally receptive as an actor that there are so, there's a whole plethora of things that can affect you on your way to the audition, in the audition, that can alter your concentration. Um, so I, I love auditioning because it gives me a space and a chance to play in the thing that I love doing. But sometimes the audition that you're going for may be a stepping stone to the audition that you really want. Mm. So sometimes you kind of go there going, oh, no, I want this job, but I've got to go for it anyway. I've had some really weird auditions. I've had some really amazing auditions. I want to know about one of the weird ones. One of the Can weird you think ones. off the top of your head? <laughs> when you're asked to mime, you're just like, mate. Seriously, why? Do I have to mime in the gig? No. So why are we miming here? Because nobody can do that well unless you've trained in it. So one was... Commercial castings are the weirdest because you have to do the most random things and they're very meat meat market-esque. Um, so well, there was this one audition, I can't remember even what it was for now, but I had to go in and mime that this photocopier, which was not in the room, wasn't working. That was it. And you had to mime it. I had to mime it. Oh my God. And I couldn't say anything. And I just had to mime (laughs) that this... And I said, okay, do you you need a particular emotion? Am I frustrated about it? And they went, no, no. It's just not working. Wow. (laughs) So you're like, okay. Um, But then, you know, you have some other great auditions. I had one two weeks ago and I was there for six hours. Oh my goodness. Really intense, but really amazing. Stepping out on set for the first time, you are, of course, an actress of many different talents. You do theatre, you do film, you do production, you do all of these things. But that moment must have been something else. I just can't imagine what that must have felt like. Please describe it for our audience. (laughs) Um, I was really fortunate to work whilst I was training. So when I was training at Italia Conti, they had an agency which certain students would work out of. Mm. My first big gig... Um, was The Boat That Rocked with Richard Curtis, which is a massive film, um, which is really wonderful and actually opened up some other opportunities afterwards for me. But um, I'd been on sets beforehand, but kind of music videos and things like that. Mm. I did the Tim Minchin Take Your Canvas Bags to the Supermarket music video. Oh, my God. Which is really fun. I'm going to have to go back and rewatch that later. <laughs> <laughs> it's so fun. But so I've been on lots of sets with cameras and stuff mm. like that. And also because part of my training, you worked with cameras and things like that. So I wasn't scared or shy of the camera, but also I was never shy of the camera when I was small anyway. Mm. Um, but when I went to do The Boat That Rocked, I was 17 and the scale of the production and the intricacy of the detail because I played one of the schoolgirls in it Mm. and it is a 60s period piece and so all of the um, like pencil cases that we had for example the rubbers, the pencils, the pencil sharpeners everything even inside the pencil case which we didn't open at any point for the camera was all in the 60s period it was like everything that that kind of detail that level of detail was so amazing and I remember one of the first scenes we were inside this kind of stately home and we were sat around this table and there was a window behind us and we were in the middle of a take and somebody stopped the take and they well, there was some kind of something in the back of the window that they weren't happy with and um, I remember looking through this window being like what on earth is the problem <laughs> I can't see anything that might be a problem all I could see was like a lawn and trees but somewhere really far in the distance Distance, I could see a van moving really so far away that I just remember going, wow, I, I loved that sort of level of detail. And it made me kind of, it really opened my eyes up to how many people are required to make a film a film. But having said that, working with Richard Curtis, who is just an absolute hero, and what a wonderful person. He's done such amazing things for this country and, and the world. Um, it was such a wonderful experience working on that film. It kind of set my bar of expectation for the rest of my career, which has been shattered many, <laughs> many times. I've worked on many indie um, productions, which vary massively in terms of skill and, and budget, etc. So, um, And I'm really grateful for those experiences because it's really taught me how mm. to be humble and concentrated in those situations but um yeah work working on a massive set like that at such a young age was a real kind of 
it was a, a real setting of the tone. It was mm. like, this is what I want and this is what I'm gunning for. Yeah. And I mean, you've had some amazing experiences so far. Tell me some of your proudest moments. Um, so when you get the agent call you with the job, that's there's it's kind of a moment that you well I did certainly and some other actors that I know have always kind of dreamt of is getting honey you got it they love you you know that kind of typical Estelle from Friends moment um, but but really in this case it's a job that you want to do and she's a good agent um, so when I remember the first time that happened it was for a job that I really wanted. I, I self-managed a lot of my early career, so when I finally got a good agent that called me with a good job, that was a proud moment because it was something that I used to run on the treadmill, like, imagining going, an extra 15 minutes, you got the job! <laughs> <laughs> and um, I would say other proudest moments are kind of the production element of the stuff mm. that I'm making is the breakthroughs in this is never going to happen into no, this is happening because I'm making it happen. Like making a film in Cuba is crazy. Like, <laughs> um, you know, like making that kind of transition into that world is a real proud moment for me. But also a lot of the activism work that I do, that has been some of the scariest stuff I've ever done. Um, and those have been some of my proudest kind of breakthrough moments of going, no, you know what, I'm standing up for what I believe in. Let's talk a little bit about that. I'm working with Extinction Rebellion. Awesome. Um, but I'm also doing some work um, on my own in that space as well, just in terms of generating awareness and it, calling people... Specifically for climate change? Sure. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. In terms of um, call to action and kind of... Um, motivating people in I a saw positive a way. Of you on social media. Oh yeah. In a plane. Oh yeah. Tell me a little <laughs> bit about that because I I clicked on that and it was like proper clickbait because I was like, oh, I can't believe she's got the balls to stand there and say her piece. Right. It was just like a knowing. I was like, I don't know what I'm going to say. I just know I've got to say something. And my mate was like, you sure? Because you're like on a flight. And I was like, and I just then stood up <laughs> and was like, hi everyone and then that's what happened and what you saw is what happened because I just I don't know it wasn't it wasn't like obviously it was a conscious decision but it was like something took over my body and kind of led that led that kind of action in me it was weird um but I was literally shaking and I don't think I've literally shaked like that ever in my life I mean mm. especially being on a flight you know there was reason to kind of people to panic when someone addresses a plane, you know. But fortunately, people realised quite quickly that I was just conveying a message. And it was actually received really well, which is really nice. And loads of people came up to me afterwards. And it was because I said, you know, it was about um, acknowledging the people that were out fighting on our behalf for climate justice that day. It was about mm. commemorating those people and taking a moment to think about them. It wasn't like, why are you on this flight? It wasn't like that. And, <laughs> yeah. I, and you know, I kind of went, I'm on this flight too, you mm. know? And what I'm saying is that we all need to acknowledge what we're doing here, mm. you know? And, and that was a big step for me because it made me go, you know, every decision that I make is going to have some kind of impact on the world and I need to be aware in that. And I need to go, look, I know I'm doing something wrong, but I'm saying I'm trying to do better. And I feel like the more that all of us do that, the more we can have some kind of drive to change mm. because it's the kind of ignorance and the, and the lack of taking responsibility that's the problem. Um, everybody knows there's an issue now. So, mm. like, ignoring it, I think, is is not an option and and so calling people out on their behavior has been some of the most difficult work I've ever done but some of the proudest work that I've ever done and I feel like if there's any reason to have learned how to understand lots of different types of people and the and the way that I've learned how to be an actor is the way to know how to connect with lots of different types of people about something important and know how to convey a message to them you know so. Amazing. Oh, so much guts. I love it. <laughs> um, talking about things like that, talking about personal sacrifices for your journey. I mean, take us through some of the personal sacrifices that you've had to make in order to be in the creative arts from, you know, you said uh, in your email about 
how you miss out on family birthdays, things like that, that not fear of missing out in, in the you know derogatory sense, but the things that you have to sacrifice in order to do what you do. Tell me about that. What, 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 have, what have you had to do in order to be in this industry? I think the wonderful thing is that I've always been in it and I've always done it. So there's a, a great understanding in all my family and friends that it is part of who I am. You know, it's not something that I've just started doing and I'm dabbling in or whatever. It's something that has always been a, a half of who, my, who I am, basically. So I've got a very supportive understanding circle, which is really wonderful. But when you are telling your cousin that you can't go to his wedding, you know, you do kind of question yourself and go, what is the right thing here? What's the right thing to do? But I always speak to them first if it's something really kind of important like a wedding or like a really big birthday or something like that I'll say look I'm in this situation and they will always say go and do it you mm -hmm. know and there have definitely been times in my life where like I've cancelled holidays countless holidays and obviously that's not a problem anymore because I'm not booking holidays anymore <laughs> but once upon a time I, I cancelled a major trip to India with my partner Cancelled a big trip to Ibiza with a group of friends, like loads of festivals, lo loads of holidays. I mean, I'm lucky that I've been able to book those holidays in the first place. And also I went through a time in my life where I was like, I'm not going to not plan things in fear that something's going to come in because I need to live my life too. So I've always just gone ahead and done what I've wanted to do anyway and figured it out when I needed to. Cross that bridge when you come to it is one of my phrases, <laughs> which my friends always repeat to me. But it has been difficult at times and I've definitely had to overcompensate and kind of uh, make sure that I'm more available when I am free for my friends. And, um, you know, if it's something as drastic as a funeral, and, and luckily I haven't been in this position yet, but obviously that something like that would come first and... If someone's like really, really in need of my attention or whatever, then absolutely that would come first too. Um, but I've I feel like I sacrifice every day because I'm because you know the financial security um, that a, a usual job or a nine to five job um, would give me would mean that. I'd have some stability, you know, and that's the reason why I live on this boat and that's a reason why, um, you know, I have to live with without certain things, but that's because I've made this choice and every time that I think about not doing it, I know that I'm doing the right thing because I can't imagine myself doing anything else. So it's as simple as that, really. Talking about the, the self-sacrifice things and making space for your craft, um, we touched on it earlier, uh, your choice to meditate and to do that kind of self-realisation work. Take us a little bit more in depth into what you do. You know, how do you meditate? How do you fit that into your schedule? How important is it for you to look after your mental health? And what do you discover in the process? So I think the wonderful thing about acting is that it demands a self-inquiry. It demands an awareness of yourself. And so the kind of looking into myself and analysing my emotions started really early on with my training. So um, I've always had that kind of aspect of my personality, which is, is great. It has been overindulged at times in my life, for sure. And I've definitely identified with emotions too much in different parts of my life as well. Um, but the kind of working through trauma has been something that has become more fascinating to me in the last few years because it's made me really recognise the power of the kind of therapeutic aspect of acting training because you have to learn what it is to be somebody else. You have to put yourself in someone else's shoes and that is something really, really powerful and I think so many people could benefit from such a practice. And so I've been honouring that aspect of um, my acting development more and more and it's definitely kind of working in tandem with my sort of spiritual quest at the moment. And so I then heard about this practice called Vipassana, which is something that was um, taught by Buddha and has been passed down through various descendants. And, um, and the practice is just kind of accepting reality as it is. 
no frills you sit in silence you don't you don't talk for 10 days on the first course that you do and you just observe your breath and you observe your body that's it and when I did that that first course which I just knew I had to do you know it was kind of like a calling I just heard about it I just knew something in me knew I needed to do it so I went and did it and the course is free they just ask for a donation at the end so you donate what you can and that kind of lack of entitlement I think really furthers the work it really deepens the understanding that this is a sacred practice and something that isn't try any dogma or any particular sect it's been passed down because it is just observing reality as it is it's called dharma um which is uh the kind of wheel of life everything rises to pass away so um it may sound a bit wishy-washy for some of you listeners at home but <laughs> try it i couldn't recommend it more and when i did this 10 days i went oh that's what meditation is man <laughs> and it made me really realize a lot of kind of lessons about life I've had loads of breakthroughs through meditation and I realized that all I needed to do to figure out what I was searching for was to sit still and shut up that was it and when I realized the simplicity of that message I went wow uh, if only more people knew <laughs> but uh, it takes dedication and commitment to sit you know for 11 hours a day for 10 days and not speak has that changed the way that you act because I can imagine that some people coming into the craft they'll have a certain perception probably like when you were younger you know I want to be famous I need to you know act like this person but not be in the present with that person or that character how has that deepened your craft I think it's deepened it in that I have a deeper awareness of who I am now so like I what I mentioned earlier about realising what part of me is the obstacle and being able to recognise parts of myself more clearly to remove them so that I can then channel a character freely. <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. Um, OK, so we're coming probably to the end of the interview now and I want to know for you whether this is a spiritual thing, a physical thing or an emotional thing, what do you consider your bravest moment or moments I would say my bravest moments have been when I have stood in the face of a challenge and decided to do it anyway. When I've been told that I'm not good enough um, or that it's not possible and I've found a way to make it possible. And that's broad, but that's applied to so many different aspects of my career. And I think just deciding every day to commit to it because I have a choice, I can walk away from it any day, you know, I'm not contracted to anybody apart from myself. So deciding when I wake up every day to still commit so much of my free time to this thing that has no stability, I think it's really brave. I absolutely <laughs> agree. Um, talking to our younger listeners now that are thinking about coming into acting and they're maybe struggling with their life decisions you know might have a pushy family saying oh no we want you to take a more stable route or and they're desperate to do what you're doing what advice what piece of advice do you wish that you've been given at a younger age advice at a younger age i know what i would say um and that would be make sure that you can't see yourself doing anything else be prepared for the rejection and and the brutal um, face of the industry because it doesn't matter how skilled you are who you know sometimes it's not personal but it's difficult not to take it personally because it's an extension of who you are and if you really identify with what you do for a living as who you are then that can really um, that can really play um, a hazardous role in your mental health so I think you need to be in a stable mind, I think you need to have a good support system. The wonder of technology we have available means that you could make a film on your phone if you really wanted to. <laughs> so if you want to be a filmmaker, start experimenting with your phone in your free time. If you want to be an actor, start filming yourself in your free time. And there are so many ways of getting into the industry now. Um, they do street casting all the time and street casting is when you're approached by casting directors literally on the street if you're 
basically the character that, uh, that they're looking for. And there's so many ways of um, reaching out to agencies now on the internet that there there is no question that you can't get into this industry if you want to. If you want to do it, there are so many means and ways of doing it. Um, just make sure that you're doing it for the right reasons, I'd say. So talking about technology, where can people find you on social media, etc., if they want to follow your work? So on Instagram, I am Katie, with an IE, underscore Goldfinch. Um, I do have a Twitter account, which is Katie Goldfinch, and I do have a public Facebook account page which is also Katie Goldfinch and I have a website which is www.katiegoldfinch.co.uk which has some of my latest work and links to my showreel, my CV and my social media and also you can contact me via that as well. So Fantastic, well thank you so so much for having us here today, it's been a pleasure <laughs> to listen to all the fantastic things that you've been doing, it's been a real real joy, thank you so much. Well, my friends, I hope you enjoyed Katie's interview as much as I did here at The Brave Moment. I think I took away more than I realised from that interview. Being someone who likes to be surrounded by home comforts, stepping onto Katie's houseboat, which was a pure zen space, made me realise just how sentimental I can be about unnecessary stuff. And I love the idea that making space from all the clutter in your physical life allows more space to be creative. I think it kind of really hit a chord with me actually. I love that her space also showed a continuation of her awareness into her impact on the planet she is trying so hard to protect. Casey had, in her own words, a calling to her craft at a very young age and I think that no matter what your calling is, having the courage to follow it, to go all in, will in itself manifest opportunities for you. And if you are considering leaving a job that doesn't speak to you or make your soul sing, making a commitment to your craft means that you have no choice but to really try and make it work. And we know that those who give 100% to what they do always achieve their goals in the end. Being someone who loves delving into meditation, I found it so interesting to hear Katie's results from her own self-work, her own self-inquiry, that she learned that success is being happy in your day to day and not necessarily becoming famous, that those moments of acceptance and fulfillment in the self allow you to not crave the need of recognition from others and that being aware of who you really are on the inside can help you to stay grounded, focused and poised in those moments where someone may question who you really are or what you stand for. I also really loved how she just dives right in. She says yes to opportunity, to different facets of the industry and how the journey from thinking it's never going to happen to making it happen for yourself has opened up so many doors for her creatively and also changed her beliefs about her own capabilities. I could really relate to that because in the past when trying to define what it is that I do to the average person... I found it difficult to say that I was a creative opportunist because there is a limiting belief out there that you should only be one thing, that if you use your talent in multiple ways, you must be a jack of all trades and master of none. But being creative means being creative, not settling inside the box, but playfully using your creative curiosity to explore and deepen different facets of your talent. I truly love that the point that you should cross certain bridges when you come to them, that maintaining a great support network means that you are granted a certain freedom to really go for your dreams and that no matter how the cards fall on the table, that your friends and family underpin and understand you and your work. Finally, it's never too late to pursue your dream. In this day and age, with the unlimited access we have to social media, the internet and our technology, we can absolutely make a film, make a showreel, make our own opportunities or make a difference. That if you want to use your voice to change a world view or to show the world your gift, then this is your time. As Arthur Conan Doyle once rightly said, once you eliminate the impossible, whatever remains, no matter how improbable, must be the truth. So ask yourself, what is true for you? What is your true calling and how can you creatively and bravely express it? Maybe now is the time to embark on a new path where your feet may inevitably bleed, 
but at the end of it, there will be a new way. Thank you so much for listening today. Next time, we talk to the legend that is Guy Proctor, editor of Country Walking Magazine and creator of the hashtag Walk a Thousand Miles that has virally changed the lives of people from all around the world, including myself, when I took on the challenge to walk from one end of my country to the other. If you enjoyed the show, please share, click, review, subscribe and follow us at the handle Coping to Mastery on all social media platforms. Please also get in touch with your creative stories and, of course, your brave moments. Take care out there, and I'll be speaking to you soon. Bye.